Thank you, Annie. Um, a warm welcome. Uh, this is a panel that I have the pleasure to moderate. My name is Bela Virek. I'm managing partner in Arthur Little Austria. I am part of our global technology economics competence center and happy to welcome to our No 5G Without Cloud Native panel, Mark Dusner, head of mobile networks and mass market communication at Swisscom, Patrick Rokita, VP of Systems Architecture in NetNumber, and Rabi Dabusi, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Rabi, uh, the Chief Strategy Officer over in Rakuten. A, a warm welcome to elaborate a bit on the, um, on the introduction. Um, Mark has been 16 years in a multitude of technology and strategy roles, initially in Vodafone Kabel Deutschland. In Germany, um, he then switched the, um, shall I say empires, Mark, to join T-Systems International as an MD for the healthcare and security solution portfolio of T-Systems. And today he is responsible um, for more than a year at Swisscom for mobile networks and mass market communication. I'm very happy to have you on this panel. Second, um, we have uh, Rabi. Rabi has been Chief Revenue Officer at Rakuten Symphony. Rakuten Symphony is the new business organization within the Rakuten Group that is there to spearhead the global adaption of cloud native open RAN infrastructures and services. Ravi brings more than two decades of experience in the mobile industry to Rakuten and is now responsible to taking Rakuten Symphony's telco solutions, including the Rakuten communications platform, to operators, governments, and enterprises around the world. And I think there is a few successes that uh, we can share on this. And then um, last but not least, we have Patrick. Patrick's a VP of Systems, of Systems Architecture at NetNumber um, and has been there for nine years He's almost 30 years in the, in the telecoms business. He's currently working with other net number team members on 5G and on migrating the net number integration and product portfolio to cloud native solutions. And I think that's a great backdrop to discuss the topic that we have at hand. A very warm welcome to everybody. I hope I represented you correctly, first of all. All good? Perfectly, thank you, Bella. Thank you, gentlemen. So um, cloud native itself is a, um, I, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a term that, that can at least be misunderstood as well. But um, when, when we say cloud native, we refer to the, the, the technical version of it um, in, in the sense of um, we, we use cloud native stateless technology to integrate our various applications. And I would like to start with you, Patrick, um, at, at, at NetNumber, you have decided to port um, your existing service portfolio to cloud native. Why at all? Why, why did you do that? And, and how's that going? Uh, yeah, so hello everybody. And thanks for, um, for the opportunity to be on this panel. And yet to your question, um, and, and to be perfectly honest, the initial trigger for NetNumber was uh, delivering uh, network security solutions that require ultra low latency. So in the technical terms, we are talking here about the protection of the core networks against the so-called category three attacks uh, defined by GSMA that require dynamic data to be shared in real time across a geographically distributed system. And uh, because our legacy technology didn't, didn't uh, cope with that at those low latencies, we have decided to look at third party solutions and have identified one that is widely used since years across the IT industry. And integrating some of the leading solutions from what uh, we call the enterprise software stack that provide for high throughput, low latency, hyperscalability, but also for sophisticated telemetry and data analytics was one of the important steps towards what we today call the uh, net number titanium cloud native intergenerational platform. And in addition, and, and this, this is important, net number went through a one year lasting transformation of its organization and processes to embrace the agile way of work, working to bring additional security aspects into its software development and CI CD processes and of course, to learn how to build cloud native solutions that utilize microservices, architectures, containers, Kubernetes, and more. So all this was anyway needed to satisfy the requirements of the telco industry for the 5G core networks, but we have decided and successfully managed 
to elevate also the net number legacy products on the benefits of cloud native for a higher degree of automation and operational efficiency. So it was mostly an efficiency um, uh, question. Now, if I look over to Rakuten, uh, Rabin, you have um, avoided the transition altogether and built it cloud native from the start. Um, what led you to take that decision? Yeah, so Bella, I, I tend to agree with uh, Patrick, but let me go back to the definition of cloud native so that we're all talking about the same thing. And even though May definition may be a little bit off, but at least we would have a common understanding. Um, a cloud environment is typically what we refer to as the heavy cloud stack of a hypervisor model, where you have a host OS, a hypervisor, uh, sitting in between and a guest OS plus your application. In the enterprise world, this has served us really well over the last decade uh, and over a decade potentially, initially starting to provide uh, consumer applications by hyperscalers, but ultimately um, uh, moving and transitioning towards a full enterprise workload and a full enterprise environment on a virtualized cloud. So this is the abstraction of hardware and software that the industry in telecom has been going through from core IMS, the what we used to call IN network, the security elements that what Patrick mentioned, um, and many others. Your previous uh, uh, your previous uh, speaker uh, SS8 was talking about some of the elements there. That has happened. What had not happened in the past in LTE and four in 3G and 4G was the virtualization of the RAN software, which is now taking place as we transition to an ORAN deployment. So that's a virtualized cloud environment. A cloud native environment is to take it to the next level of uh, efficiency, as, as was mentioned earlier, building what we call a light cloud stack. And at Rakuten, we've done both. We started out with a completely virtualized stack uh, just before we launched our LTE commercial network in April of 2020. And then we migrated the software architecture, most importantly, the RAN software architecture to become more modularized, more containerized and microservices based architecture. And I'll share with you a few, a few references here and there. So the image size in a cloud environment is uh, multiple gigabytes in size. Uh, the image size in a Kubernetes in a containerized, so the CNF uh, image size is in the neighborhood of a, a few hundred megabytes. So the difference is massive. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to bring up a VNF with the heavy cloud stack, and it takes about a few seconds to bring up a CNF in a light cloud stack. So that, that's kind of the delta in some of the numbers and performance. Obviously, your elasticity will change your ability to leverage the microservices across domains and across functions, your ability to do auto scaling, auto healing. Uh, CICD, um, automation and orchestration, that increases significantly. And we see this an essential element of deploying a completely virtualized uh, a stack for the telco, the end-to-end -end telco, most importantly, the real-time applications, in addition to security, I would say RAN, becoming um, super critical here because as you deploy the softwareized BBU, what we call VDU and VCU, you need to manage and control the real-time clocking, syncing, timing, forward error correction, CRC check. There's a lot of lo-fi or the physical layer uh, protocol functions that require you to have such an agile and efficient and near real-time processing of, uh, of the data flows, both, both on control planes and uh, user planes. So that, that's really, I just want to level set the understanding and share our experience at least with some concrete numbers. But I want to um, to to um, go deeper on on the aspect of why you did that. It seems that the um, you know the requirements to have capacity out in the landscape to uh, perform the functions that a four G network already had have been solved prior, and it seems that um, you can get a five G network also without being cloud native um, using the current incumbent equipment uh, provider solutions that, that we have. Um, why 
why what's the benefit of doing it in in in, in the cloud native way that Rakuten has done it? Yeah, so that's a different topic, Bella, and it's not necessarily related to cloud native or not. It's more related to the abstraction and disaggregation of proprietary hardware from software logic. Um, the, the industry over the last two and a half, three decades has been locked to a handful of vendors and the number of those vendors continue to shrink. Now we have, I would say, three to five legacy vendors that are mm -hmm. dominating this market. With the advancement of compute network and storage, which has happened in cloud in the enterprise world over the last 10 years, we realize that having the opportunity to be a greenfield and start with a first principle approach, a clean slate approach to designing our network, we've chosen to go with a completely virtualized path, completely softwareized path, which brought us uh, multiple benefits. The first one is the obvious uh, uh, capex and opex cost reduction because now you move from proprietary hardware with uh, pricing and and um, a markup that is uh, uh, unforeseen to us that we, we don't understand the formula we see very similar kind of components very similar architecture in a proprietary stack uh, with a monolithic system a combination of hardware and software versus now you have a commodity processor commodity memory commodity uh, network uh, infrastructure which gives you that capex and opex reduction in addition, uh, we wanted to build the best network in Japan, uh, obviously the best network <laughs> in the world as well. So what we wanted is um, bring the efficiencies and bring the performance in, in this virtualized network. By the way, all of the network functions in, in Rakuten in Japan um, is running on software now. Uh, or and most importantly, which is really the, the biggest and the most challenging part, but core IMS, all of the associated gateway functions, whether it's security or uh, interconnect to PLMN and PSTN, all of them are virtualized and many of them are becoming containerized and network uh, and uh, cloud native. Um, the other benefit that it gave us is um, it gave us this freedom from being dependent on one or two legacy vendors. Um, in, in our network in Japan today, we have over eight different radio vendors, uh, depending on the form factor of the radio, whether it's macro, massive MIMO, small cell, indoor, femto, uh, handheld devices such as Rakuten Connect and, and Rakuten Pocket. So these, these applications are all coming from different radio vendors, right? running on the same ORAN stack in a cloud environment. And that really, that really is the second benefit. The third, when you move to cloud, your ability to automate and orchestrate gets to a profound level of dimensions that you had never ever imagined to do um, in your previous proprietary environment because the, the automation of that proprietary environment comes as a proprietary tool as well. So stitching them together, doing cross-domain automation, like I said, the auto-scaling, auto-healing, the elasticity, scaling out and scaling in based on your traffic and customer uh, demand on the, on the systems, uh, regardless whether they are edge or core, all of that flexibility gives you the ability to now build a true self-autonomous network that gets you to a level three, level four uh, autonomous network. So these are the three key benefits that we were aiming Thank after. Thank you, Rabin. Um, and I'll, I'll come back and challenge that a little bit, but I want to also give the word to Mark. Uh, we've heard, Mark, that there is um, functional benefits. We've heard that there are automation operational benefits. We've heard that breaking up the ecosystem is a fantastic idea. Um, in, in, in your perspective, thinking about the customer, is there incremental benefits to be had? I think that that, that really needs to be separated into two ways. Um, first of all, we need to look at what cloud native functionality will be provided soon, right? Um, I mean, uh, Rakuten has, has is spearheading, um, let's say that movement, but in a more classical environment like the ones we run, um, cloud native mostly comes along with uh, the 5G SA deployments. So these will and are the first network functions that are running cloud native. And um, they bring the benefits of uh, what SA provides, right? So um, it provides better uplink um, performance and therefore better coverage, uh, better latency, 
um, and the ability to 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 add functionalities like like slicing, so a guaranteed way of doing your networking for enterprise customers, especially. Um, that's the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, and I think uh, Ravi uh, elaborated on that one quite well, is the way how you manage the networks, and that um, that is something um, that's an innovative. Uh, or an innovation power that is maybe not that transparent at the first sight, but um, I at least com compare that to my team um, every now and then, um, like the, the revolution we see in the car industry, where we have cars that look similar, but the ones running on electricity nowadays um, getting more and more innovative, not only on the motor, right? I mean, it's it's the the whole way you work. It's the 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 idea of having continuous updates, continuous deployments. Um, for example, in a Tesla, um, that really makes the difference. And the same applies here. Um, if you really get into that cloud native environment, um, you need different skill sets on your team. So it's not the network engineer anymore, like the motor engineer in the car industry, but it's the software engineer that drives the revolution. And that is, on the one hand side, a big challenge to all of us. On the other side, um, this will bring, first of all, higher quality because continuous integration, continuous deployment means we have only incremental deployments, which increases um, the, the quality. It increases uh, resilience because it's easy to deploy and redeploy. And it will increase uh, speed of innovation because uh, bringing in new functionality is something that, that is done automatically. Today, or in, in classical environments, a major release of a core is done maybe once or twice a year, right? And now we're talking about it, it once per day. The, the step is, is definitely smaller, that is faster. And that is what, what we experienced in IT over the last decade. And this is now moving to, to, to the taco industry. And that will bring uh, benefits to the customers in terms of innovation that partially we don't know of yet. So when you look at the business case for um, transitioning over to a cloud native setup for 5G, does that business case rest on uh, lower capex and opex, or also does it also have a component of a, a um, increased revenue due to customer experience? So I'm not talking new use cases in B two B or whatever. I'm talking about improving customer experience as a result increasing your attachment and your retention and, and attractiveness to new customers, new service. Is there any link where we say, if 5G were not cloud native, we couldn't um, actually um, have these customer experiences and therefore we can attribute customer experience improvements also to 5G cloud native? Is there a link or should it not be on a business case? It should be on a business case. Although okay. um, as, as you mentioned earlier on, some of the innovations we don't know. I mean, we are all talking about slicing, but slice is not a product, right? Uh, what, what kind of products will use that and will really benefit is, is to be seen. But enabling that capability and therefore enabling innovation on top will bring benefits. And in addition, as I've said, um, a higher resilience, a higher reliability of the network enabled by quick, the ability to quickly react um, is another aspect that will bring true benefits to our customers. And um, and yes, uh, the other side of the business case for sure is is increased efficiency. Was it in the um, in, in did Swisscom commit to a cloud native uh, transition? I'm sorry, if you cannot say, then don't say. We didn't align on the question. I'm just... we, we we are on on our transition to cloud native. Yes, and that business case did include top line as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I want to go back to uh, to you, Rabin. Uh, you 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 threw. Um, the, the automation operational efficiency as well. Um, I, I saw you nod heavily when I talked about customer experience, but before I, I want before you elaborate on the on the top line impact and on the customer experience impact of, of cloud native, um, I want to challenge the um, the opex and capex remarks and the breaking up the vendor ecosystem, right? Because essentially the logic would be as follows: the present ecosystem of incumbent suppliers is not giving you the performance or the um, innovation speed or the financial frame for you that, that, that meets your business needs. Therefore, you need to go outside and you're happy that, that you were able to do that 
in, 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 in given that 5G is a software stack, right? Because if they were to deliver that, there wouldn't be any need to break it up in the first place, right? So um, it, it, if that is true, then you are left with the integration cost and you're left with the testing cost and effort and risk and and repeat you know every time apple plays out a new thing you know you, you got to sort of follow along and test it and integrate and manage the related ecosystem in a full cost view do you believe that rakuten has a more efficient approach and this is a hard question Rabbi, i'm sorry but I, I i i do want to drill you on that do you think that Rakuten can do that more efficiently than, than Ericsson or Nokia or Huawei can? Yeah, I mean, look, to answer the question directly, we have shared publicly that we're seeing 30% to 40% reduction on TCO. Um, and we've done this analysis and calculation for many potential customers and customers for us globally. Um, you will find that your mileage will vary. Uh, Mark touched on a point that is very important. Your mileage will vary depending on the level of adoption of both the softwareization of the stack as well as the automation that you implement in there. Um, and to answer the other question about the, the, um, the cost structure and cost reduction, Look, we were, we were months away from signing a deal with Huawei when we started building the network in 2018. Months away when we put it on hold and started exploring this path of building the world's first cloud native network. Um, and to us, the, the business uh, case was quite easy um, at a very, very high level, Bella. Is it going to benefit us to build a network that is similar to what exists in Japan, that is based on the same cost structure that is designed with 20th uh, century technologies? Or would it be better for us to spend less money on the network build instead of $12 billion less than $10 billion? So saving, saving a significant amount of money on your cost structure allows you to compete on things that uh, you wouldn't be able to, such as the actual tariffs and the ARPU. So this is at very, very simple high level business case. But then when you start adding the use cases on top of it, that you enable through this architecture. And I would argue, no, we would not have chosen the Ericsson's and the Huawei's and the Nokia's of the world simply because that model would not work for us. Um, one very important thing that was mentioned also by Mark is it, it takes you six to eight months to do a network upgrade. And I'll give you an example of narrowband IoT. We just turned narrowband IoT on in Japan about a month ago. The software was available from our ORAN vendor about two months before. A complete CICD cycle took place with validation. And within weeks of having that software released, it was deployed with a click of a button across over 35,000 sites across Japan, with a click of a button in one change window in one evening. That, that is unheard of in the industry. And that use case, although narrowband IoT can give you so many additional products on top of it, that use case is just an example. Think about the core functionalities supporting standalone, um, ultra low latency, all the use cases that you can build on that. So that agility and speed definitely played a massive role in our business case and our ability to differentiate as we enter as the fourth new operator uh, challenger in, in, in the market. So the cost structure um, was a very important uh, element. And then the way we operate the network and the way we roll out services and products and experiences is the second part. And having, having gone through this journey over the last three and a half years, we wouldn't choose any other path. We know we are on the right path to build a 21st uh, century network for 21st century services. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, Patrick, we've now heard that there is a link to servicing or a feature set that you can offer customers more quickly and more efficiently and more dynamically, and you can do so at lower cost. When you think of a cloud native 5G environment and you think about net numbers, how, do, how does that help you as a service or solution provider if it were cloud native, as opposed to being the, the traditional stack? 
Is there a difference in your service um, approach and, and breadth of market that you can address? Yeah, definitely. So um, the question mainly starts with how, why we, do we consider cloud native uh, being important? And that's something to do with the innovation and evolution that is simply a must in a world that continuously demands for more and faster data. And this generates the challenge uh, of the more data, the more compute power and capacity for storage. And the faster the data, the more you must distribute your network. And in order to run and manage such networks in an economic way, and it's really about the economics of the networks that we build, you need cloud native solutions delivering services and resources right where you, where you need them and when you need them. So such dynamics require a high degree of automation and reliable delivery and deployment processes that again are both characteristics of cloud native solutions. So with the evolution and the migration to cloud native and 5G, we simply need to get the automation and operational efficiency up. And the best thing in my opinion is looking at the cloud native from the IT perspective. I mean, Netflix, LinkedIn, Facebook, Uber, <laughs> we use them every day from any place in near real time in HD quality and with almost zero footprint on our devices. And we also know how video conferencing, homeworking, homeschooling, uh, how, how much we have benefit from it uh, during the ongoing pandemic situations. So it's a natural evolution step that the telcos now adopt the cloud native technology and that 5G is a cloud native solution by definition. For sure, you can theoretically deploy it in a different way. But if you don't, don't want to fall back and catch up a few years from now, uh, where, the, where, the, where the gap will be bigger and bigger and bigger, then you better start now. You know, in the 90s, there were, there were people saying, we don't need 3G, yeah? 15 years ago, I heard people saying, we don't need SSDs. So I believe that cloud native is needed for 5G. Thank you. You're leading me to the final rounds of, of, of questions. And that is, um, we, we, I, I hear the, the cost benefits that the Rabi posed. I hear the... Um, innovation benefits that, that Mark mentioned that also lead to, to customer experience. Let's think a few years into the future, okay? Let's, let's think, you know, uh, maybe five years, maybe 10 years into the future. Because one of the topics I think, Patrick, that you mentioned was the, the needed change in capability and in skill. You become more of a software company and less of a networking company. You'll need more software engineers um, to... Um, uh, in order to be able to cater, manage, operate, develop, even assess solutions and, and you know solution design, etc., it's, it's a it's a software process. Is that transition at all avoidable? And if not, right? So if we're saying um, no, it, eventually five years down the road, ten years down the road, it'll be obvious that all operators will have migrated their networking functions to a cloud native environment, right? If, if that's the the other, so if it is impossible to avoid that. And it is also sensible to do so. Um, how does that? How, how do you see the landscape change, in in sense of the co-opetition with hyperscalers? Do they become your partners, or do they become, uh, do they threaten parts of your business? So this is two questions. The first is: Is that evolution avoidable? And I want to start with you, Mark. Is it, is the evolution avoidable? And two: If it is not avoidable, if it's obvious, then. Um, do you feel threatened by the big software players and hyperscalers? Okay, so, so let me start with number one. Um, I don't think that, that it is avoidable, and I would even not use the term avoidable because I don't want to avoid it, right? Um, I, I don't want to avoid progress. And um, getting back to, to what Ravi just said, we are already doing continuous deployment, for example, in RAN. Um, uh, in, a, in a similar speed as Ravi mentioned. And we are deploying uh, machine learning techniques in order to optimize our networks uh, on a regular basis. And, and, but increasing that even further and doing it on an end-to-end -end perspective will only be possible if you apply those new technologies uh, and the new skills to orchestrate the whole network, not, not parts of the network and optimizing them, but really optimizing the, the whole chain from core to access to transport. Um, so, so I think that that is the progress. And your second part, uh, your second question was, um, what, what if it role, is if it what, is obvious? What, yeah, sorry, please. What 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 the hyperscalers will, what kind of roles they will play, right? Will it be competition? Will it be competition? 
Um, you might have seen that we, we announced a, a partnership with AWS on uh, uh, our IT workloads as well as uh, uh, working on with them on uh, applying, let's say, the benefits uh, into, into, into telecommunications, right? So this is a learning journey that both sides need to, to, to go ahead. But um, just simple examples, think about, um, I mean, today we run data centers and I, I do see that we will do that for quite some time. Nevertheless, there is some elasticity that you either pay for, if you run the data center, then you have to have the hardware or that you can buy. And just think about load testing, a simple example. Um, I, I either have load generators massively uh, at hand, which I use only once per month or whatever, or I can easily uh, generate load with a hyperscaler, or I can, um, um, I do have very different loads. Today, we, we dimension our networks, especially the core side for the peak hours, right? Um, so um, most of the time they're running in idle. Is that efficient? It's not. So I think that there is a play, there are benefits um, that we can use from, from the hyperscalers, not only on the elasticity, but also partially on the tool chains. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in every part, but in certain parts we will. So uh, Patrick, to you, uh, if you already made the remark that it is unavoidable, but um, if, if, that is, if that is the case, um, what is your take on the co-petition with hyperscalers? Similar as Mark saying, it's part of the tool set that you need, or do you think that actually they will control certain parts of the ecosystem that will um, be more of, of a competition to you? Yeah, so when I consider net number as a network uh, provider, then uh, and, and, and the hyperscalers, uh, besides offering uh, compute power, what they primarily do and what they are primarily valued for, if they move uh, one level up and offer also network solutions, which some of them started to do by acquisition of telco companies, they do. Then yeah. yeah, then definitely they, they will be a, an, an overlap um, and competitive situation. Uh, between the network providers and, uh, and and hyperscalers, and as well, there will be a competition between the communication service providers uh, and, and 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 the hyperscalers, especially in the enterprise and industry market. I mean, we we see at every company how much we benefit from uh, IT-based solutions uh, delivered uh, from the from the uh, IT-based companies, and and they will also go for 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 the voice or communication service offering to supplement the IT-based services that anyway already delivered to the enterprises. So I see the hyperscaler in shorter or longer term to compete with both the network providers and communication service providers. Currently, we deploy our cloud native solutions uh, in, in bare metal, virtual, and also private and public clouds. So we need to prove uh, towards our customers that whatever in infrastructure they decide to proceed with, when building their 5G or other telco networks, we can basically follow. So we are uh, teaming up with the hyperscalers to uh, deploy and verify our solutions in different kinds of private and public clouds. That's currently our ongoing activity. So um, then, uh, Rabin, the, the way I look at Rakuten, and I've I've obviously followed your case, and we've we've had. Um... Uh, certain touch points, let's put it this way, in the past. I could imagine that Rakuten Symphony actually aspires to become the hyperscaler in the network, in the cloud native network environment for radio networks, right? If that is the case, um, first of all, is that the case? Is that how you see um, Rakuten Symphony? Well, I mean, we provide a private cloud platform to deploy your network on. Um, in the future, we will turn that platform into a marketplace for consuming network workloads and network functions. That doesn't necessarily mean we'll become a hyperscaler like AWS and GCP providing general cloud services. It is a very specific and targeted cloud platform for mm -hmm. mobile operators. Uh, so to a certain degree, there is, there is similarity. But let me answer, the, the, the answer to the question, is it avoidable? My answer is no, it's not. Most operators around the world today are building capabilities in both the new world of cloud and virtualization and softwareization. 
to a certain degree building a, a capabilities in R and D in that space because uh, there's no two networks that look the same around the world. There's over fourteen hundred mobile operators. Each one of them is unique. It has mm -hmm. unique deployment architecture, etc. So. We, we believe that the organization of the future, which was touched on earlier, is important to marry the old and the new together. So you need to graft your teams with uh, cloud, with software, with automation knowledge that did not exist in the old world of telco, where the principles of designing, dimensioning, optimizing the network are totally different. And that is very apparent in my interactions with mobile operators around the world, where there is a level of education that needs to take place on software and virtualization. So that's that's one part. And I believe that we are way in, in that journey. At least every operator I speak with has some form of a cloud strategy and a cloud environment. Now, as a mobile operator, do I compete with the hyperscalers or do I uh, partner with them? And I believe it is, is it is a mix of the two, and it all depends on how what your relationship construct is with those hyperscalers. For example, if you're leveraging them for your um, the split brain of the BBU, which is the CU software at the kind of the distributed network uh, uh, deployment, and your CDC workloads, core, IMS, IN, charging, billing, OSS, BSS. I think there is a level of value there because now you're leveraging an already proven cloud platform. If if they do have the the blue the footprint in your country, then you're at an advantage. Uh, if you don't, then you'd have to build it with them, or you build it separately uh, with another cloud partner or yourself in your own data centers. But where the competition starts becoming real is once you deploy on, on such a public cloud environment, regardless whether it's carved out and secured or shared, you start sharing the most important asset of your business, which is customer data, customer uh, heuristics, customer behavior, customer consumption. And that opens up the door for the hyperscalers to uh, exploit this data, which historically has been the gold mine that many operators have not been able to tap into. And I can share with you many examples of how we've tapped into this, this gold mine. We created a data lake that consolidates all customer and network um, heuristics and, and, and logs and applied analytics and advanced uh, techniques of algorithmic analysis on top of them to bring value to us, to create more uh, 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 benefits to the customers, to create new services. If the Googles and the AWSs and the Microsoft are going to target your customer directly, they're in direct competition with you. If they're going to offer their services independent of your um, uh, value chain, then they are competing with you. But if you construct it in a way where you're actually partnering, if you go to Google and say, I'm going to offer YouTube Prime um, and, and YouTube uh, and, and Netflix and other services that those hyperscalers are offering, um, if, if you're going to partner with them on the value chain, then this is partnership. So it depends heavily on the construct at which you strike that partnership with the hyperscalers. And, Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I think we are one minute overdue, Annie. There were two questions from the audience. Um, I trust that the two questions have been answered, especially in the last few minutes by Rabbi. They were both addressed to him. Um, I, I hope so, Edgar and Anders, that that was actually the case. Um, and with that, I want to thank the, the panel for, for uh, this exchange on that actually resulted in one, it, it's unavoidable, two, you don't want to avoid it because it brings you cost benefit and experience benefit. And, and three, it is possible to do, but you got to build it in a way that allows you to um, reap the benefits and not spill the golden pot, as Rabbi uh, put it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, that was um, a great conversation, really interesting. So thank you to all of you. And I do hope your questions was, were answered. Uh, Rabbi, if you want to carry on, uh, if you've anything more to add, you can do that in the Q&A um, channel offline, if that's, if you wish no to. No problem, thank and you very much. Thank you very much for a cracking conversation.